Okay. So I'm going to start talking about SQL. I'm going to talk about something called DDL, which is the data definition language, uh, because SQL is broken into three pieces. There's the DDL, the DML, and the DCL. We will never talk about DCL in this course. Uh, it's more database administration stuff. A DDL allows you to build your house. DML allows you to decorate your house. Um, so DDL is where you create tables and stuff like that. And I also cover the concept in a fairly thin way. Some teachers will spend an entire lecture on create table, which is a waste of time. Because every database server does it differently, within reason. Therefore, what I do is I cover the basic format of it. And then I give you a link if you're not sure how to do something where the documentation is. It's one of the few times I tell you, go read the documentation. Because, like I said, uh, the, the create table statement for Postgres, if you were to print it, it would be about 17 pages long, just the instructions on how to create a table. The, the syntax, like the, the, the reference, not the actual, you know, this is how you create a table, blah, blah, blah. This is like, these are the parameters. Um, I'll cover insert, update, and delete, and then I'll cover out the most basic select statement. But with anything else in computers, you should know where things come from. SQL is a special purpose programming language. It's designed to do one thing. Now, so most of you know what a general purpose programming language is. Java is a general purpose programming language. Python as a general purpose programming language. It's a language you can use to write pretty much anything. You basically write a program, it accepts input, it does stuff, blah, blah, blah. SQL is a special purpose programming language. It's designed to do only one thing and do it well. That means you can't write user interface in it, you can't do that kind of stuff. It's designed to talk to a database and only talk to a database. Uh, anybody here ever see or heard of a language called R? What's it good for? other than make you want to cry. Data. Yeah, statistics. But the R programming language is a special purpose language for doing playing with numbers. That's its purpose in life, stats. SQL is designed for data. It was created by IBM in the early 1970s. It's been around for a while. It was originally called SQL, S-E-Q-U-E-L, Structured English Query Language. Thus, the stupid pronunciation that a lot of people insist on saying, calling it SQL instead of SQL. IBM got sued, or threatened to be sued, because a company in England had already copyrighted a product called SQL that had to do with data management. Ta-da! So IBM said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to call it structured query language, SQL, and it's an initialism, not an acronym. In other words, you pronounce, you say the letters, you don't pronounce the word. So it's SQL, not SQL. It pisses me off every time I hear someone say SQL. It'd be like me going, oh, I work for IBM. Uh, by the way, who's IBM? IBM, right? Same idea. The first commercial version came out on Oracle for version two running on VAX computers. Now, I'm guar guaranteeing almost nobody in this room, room knows what a VAX is, except for those of us of a certain, oh. I wasn't gonna use the word age. I was gonna say certain vintage. VAXs were computers. The smallest VAX was roughly the size of this desk. It had a grand total of 256K of RAM. They were indestructible. They were literally designed for hazardous environment operation. They were unkillable machines. Um, so, and then they got bigger. But they were fantastic. You literally could not kill them. Like, there's still Vaxes running today. They are not 256K models anymore. They're you know, slightly beefier, you know, one meg or two megs, but they're still running. And when they stop rocking and running, you kick them and they start working again. Literally. You just knock, it, knock everything back into place and it just starts working again. They're amazing machines. So I'm ready to bet there's still versions of Oracle 2 running out there on VAX computers, running the original version of SQL. 
So somewhere along the way, people said, hey, SQL is a good idea. We're going to make a standard. First standard came out in 1986 also known as SQL 96, not SLQ. God damn it, I didn't fix my typo again. In 1999, that's when the major changes happen where most de modern database servers follow. So there's a standard called SQL 99, and it includes advanced functionality, um, including formalized ways of doing joins between tables, and how to do recursion and how to do triggers and stored procedures and that kind of stuff was formally standardized 99. Standards came out in 2003, 2006, and 2008, mostly for XML stuff. And they finally formalized the truncate command, which I'll be talking about at some point. Um, instead of is not really that important. But basically, we had three separate standards come out for XML, which nobody almost uses anymore. Because nobody uses XML. Everybody uses JSON instead. <coughs> Currently, last time I checked, is SQL 2011. And it's just a bunch of functionality that nobody uses for the most part. Um, most servers will always say we're SQL 99 compliant. That means that odds are it'll do everything you need it to do. So database servers really haven't changed since the year 2000 in core functionality. It's been 19 years. They all have new functionality, but it's just fine-tuning things that they could already do before. They're just making it easier to make it happen. That's what they're doing. So SQL is made up of three pieces, which I already mentioned. There's a data definition language, also known as DDL. It creates and maintains objects. There's the DML, which creates and maintains data. And the data control language, which is basically used for security. A DCL tells you, yes, you're allowed to talk to this. No, you're not allowed to touch that. The language itself is case insensitive. Object names and the data can be case sensitive, depending on the server. OK, the two of you. Yes. XML is like that person that likes to talk about themselves for like an hour before they actually get the round to telling you what they want to tell you. JSON's the guy who hits you up with a text message. How's that? XML is really good because it's very structured, but you end up spending 90% of the data you're transmitting telling the other side what the structure is. JSON is unstructured. It just, you read it, you explode, it becomes an array, and away you go. So. So, like I said, the language is case insensitive. That means the keywords in SQL are not case sensitive. Depending on the database server, the object names may or may not be case sensitive. The data, if you're lucky, will be case sensitive. Unless you're working on MySQL, then it's case insensitive unless you tell it to be. Which I've been trying to teach you guys about, you know, making sure things are named a certain way to avoid some of these problems. It uses spaces as keyword delimiters. So you know how in Java, theoretically, you could write an entire program on one long line, no carriage returns, and no spaces? Because you can do that. Uh, in SQL, the interpreter will say, what's wrong with you? You know how sometimes you get, you know, get to know someone that talks so fast, you never hear the pauses between words and sentences. They just keep going and going and going. Well, l SQL is kind of slow. It doesn't like it when people don't take breaks between words. So it uses spaces as keyword delimiters. That means you should have spaces between all the major pieces in your SQL statement. The command terminator is a semicolon, just like in C. Yay, you're not going to have to relearn that. The funny thing is, though, in SQL, when you issue a single SQL command, you don't need the semicolon. Because it says, hey, you gave me one command. You don't need to tell me I'm done. I'm smart enough to know you're not talking anymore. If you send in more than one command, you use semicolons to delimit, to delimit them. 
Okay, the DDL. The DDL is made up of three commands. Create, alter, and drop. Create lets you make stuff up. Alter lets you change it. Drop lets you get rid of it. So create is like getting someone to build your house. Alter is like getting someone to put in a new window. Drop is like setting fire to your house. Actually, it's a lot faster than setting fire to your house because it's instant. Gone. Um, SQL does not have undo. You typed in the command. If you didn't make a mistake, it happened. If it wasn't what you wanted, you're, coming, you're storing from a backup. There's no recovering from mistakes. Which is why you don't let the general user type stuff in. Because it accepts it as a gospel truth, and it assumes you know what you're doing. Which is dangerous when you don't know what you're doing. So the create statement is used to create database objects, all database objects. The problem is that the create statement covers every single thing you can create in a database. Tables, views, triggers, functions, constraints, everything. So every create command, depending on what you're trying to create, the syntax is different. But essentially, the basics of it goes create, what do you want to create, what's it going to be called, and then you know, here are the, here's the definition of it. And depending on what's being created, the syntax will change dramatically. The most commonly used create statement, though, is to create tables. What's the point of create, having a database if you don't actually create rooms in the database to hold your stuff? So create the create table. Now, create table command is pretty close the same everywhere. And this command I've got here is create table. So we're going to say we're creating a table. We're going to call the table test. If my mouse comes back from the dead. No, don't do that. Oh, come on. So create the table. It's called test. You open some brackets. And the brackets are saying the definition is, in is here. And in here, what we have now is a list of fields. ID should look familiar. Big serial should also look familiar. Primary key should also look familiar. Not familiar this way, but this is all things you guys have learned about and that you've been hitting the appropriate buttons in PG Modeler about. Name, varchar 50, not null. Again, you've done the visual side of it. And then at the end, you've got active bool, not null, default true. That's lab four. Literally, this is lab four, what I just typed up on the board. When you design the stuff graphically and then you tell it to push it to the database server, it creates a command that looks roughly like this. It gives it the server, the server reads the command, determines whether it can run, and then it runs it. And then it's too late to undo. What is done is done. In the slides, I included a link this older documentation, obviously, pointed 9.5. You guys are all running on 10 or 11. The syntax hasn't changed that much. Um, gives you an idea how long I've been using this slide. This, you know, 9.5 came out four years ago, five years ago. But it's still roughly the same. Um, there's not much more to know about creating tables other than this. There's creating foreign keys, which when I do the demo, I will show you guys. But the important thing you have to remember is you're going to create a table, give it the name, open the bracket, and it's always going to be in the format of field name, data type, and then what happens afterwards are basically the rules for that field, whether it's a primary key or it's not null or it has a default. Then you have a comma. Then it's the next field. You have a comma if there's another field. Note right here, there's no comma. This is like the biggest mistake when people start doing lab six. It's not running. What's the first thing before the error message? Oh, there's a comma there. Is there any other fields? No. What did I tell you during lecture five? Oh, it's not supposed to be a comma there? No, there isn't a comma there. On the last entry in the table definition, there's never a comma. If you tell, give it a comma, it's expecting something else. It's not a very smart language, as in it's very literal. If you tell it that there's something there and there's nothing there, it, it goes, why? Why would you lie? So the next command is the alter command. 
And it's used to change the definition of objects. When you're working with a table, you can add, rename, and remove columns. You can add constraints. You can change default values, that kind of stuff. And again, depending what you're playing with, the syntax changes dramatically from altering a table to altering a view to altering a function. In, there's a link again for the alter table syntax. I don't teach you guys every version of the syntax because I could spend like an entire lecture just typing in all the different versions of the alter statement. And the stupid thing is, is half the time I'll make mistakes because I work both with Postgres and MySQL and their alter table syntax is different from one server to the other. So here's the rule when you're, you're not sure how to do something, go look up the, the official documentation. They're going to show you and these, their documentation is pretty good. Here's the easiest one. This is one to remember, also the most dangerous one, drop. Why is it easy to remember? Because it's the same syntax for almost everything and it's drop space, what's it called, semicolon done. Drop test. So drop table test, drop view, some view, and it's gone. And it's instant, by the way. Um, it, it'll be back in, you know, hundredth of a second. If that. Thousandth of a second. Um, and like I said before, there's no recovering from this. So if you're going to drop something, make sure you're dropping the right thing. Now, what comes next is the DML. And like I said earlier, I'll actually demonstrate all this so it's more coherent. Uh, DML is made up of four or five commands depending who you ask. Insert to add information in. So if you want to actually think about this, if you're going to insert a new row, it says if you're adding a new piece of paper to a file folder, you're going to insert that piece of paper in the file folder. You're going to insert a piece of paper into the a uh, piece of data into the database. Update, you're going to change the data. Unlike alter, which changes the structure, update changes the data. Delete gets rid of the data. Unlike drop, which gets rid of the house. Select allows you get the data out. Then there's truncate. Truncate is like delete, except if you're comparing a, pair, a pellet gun to a Gatling gun. Delete will delete each row of information one at a time, and if you gave it criteria, it'll only delete that one little piece of information. Truncate tells the, da the database table, you have no data. It's not that it deletes the data, it convinces the table that there's no data there. It says to the table, you are empty. Okay. It's all gone instantly. Um, most truncate operations, if you're working with a table, say three million rows, and if you did a delete, you know, delete everything kind of command, it could take four seconds to finish. The truncate will be done in a thousandth of a second. Why? Because it doesn't need to go through, say, row one, delete, row two, delete, row three, delete. It's going, <laughs> boom, all the data's gone. It's instant. Um, because it basically rewrites the table header saying there's no data here. All this space is now available. It's just like on Windows. You know when you, <laughs> you know when you delete a file on Windows, it doesn't make a difference if the file is 2K or 10, 10 gigs. It takes the same amount of time to delete. And that's because Windows tells the disk, this room is available. It doesn't actually delete the file. It just says, this space, feel free to use it. Truncate does the same thing. <coughs> now, the DML is where you can really tell that the designers of the SQL language all sat in a different room with their pocket protectors and didn't talk to each other. So you had three or four guys and they all said, okay, you're in charge of select, you're in charge of update, you're in charge of delete, and we're not going to talk about this. Then you have the Alaska who goes, I'm in charge of predicates. So I'll go talk to like the update guy and the delete guy to make sure that the predicates are the same, but we're not going to discuss what the syntax is like. And every single command is completely different. Which is become which brings the which is the Achilles heel of the SQL language is every command is completely different. It's absurd. Um 
like in most programming languages, if you have a do and a do while or a while, they're off roughly the same. The syntax is more or less the same. They do things a little bit differently, but the syntax is more or less the same. Not in SQL. So, insert allows you to add data to a table. And the syntax is insert into table. And by the way, when you see those angle brackets, less than, greater than signs, doesn't mean you're supposed to type those. I'm saying this is where you substitute a word. So insert into table, a list of columns, and a values with a list of values. The, here's the example, insert into test. That's that first table I created earlier, you know, that example. And I'm going to insert into the columns called name and active. And I'm going to insert the values, woohoo and true, into those columns. Now, the values have to match the order of the column names. So if you've got two column names, you have to have two values, and the name has to match the right thing. You're loud. Not you, the one behind you. Forgot my Nerf gun again, otherwise I wouldn't have warned you this time. So, so basically put what happens is you have to match the same order as the columns being listed. So if there's a column called name, if you put in a string into that, it has to be before the active, which is a Boolean, which is true. Now the order you do the columns in isn't important as long as the, ma the values match the order of the columns. And most of the error messages actually make sense. They'll tell you when you did something wrong. And usually they'll tell you there's an error near this. It usually means the error is right before it. Uh, depending on what kind of mood the server is on and which server you're running. Uh, someone will give you a data mismatch error. Data type mismatch error. Other ones will say, true, good enough. We'll try, put in the, we'll try to put in the word true. Um, if you try to shove a true into an integer, it's not going to work. All right, so the next one is update. And that one's used to change a row of data. As you can see, syntax looks nothing like Now this time it's the guys in front of them that are loud. Holy cow. What's wrong with this side of the room today? And I'm usually not one to tell people to shut up, but when it's distracting me, it's time for me to tell you to shut up. So it's update. You tell it what you're going to update. You tell it what you're going to set the values are going to be. And then there's the where, the conditions. Now, the where I've marked down as optional. You don't always have to tell it which ones you want to change. Then it'll change everything in that table to match. For example, I'm going to update test. I'm going to set the name to working where the ID is equal to 1. So if there's a row where the ID is equal to 1, it'll change its name to working. If you want to do more than one column update at a time, again, common delimited key value pairs. So you go name equals working, comma active equals false. Now. Last command is delete. Again, it's an easy one to remember. Delete from whatever the table happens to be called. You give it a basic rule, and then magic happens. And literally, it'll delete. That's all it does. It makes it go away. And the SQL statement I'll teach at the end. All right. I meant to launch this earlier. Yeah. Uh, the last one, the one, yeah. Like it updates all the rows. Yeah, so it to get it all no, no, no. This has nothing to do with normalization anymore. This is literally an outright command. Please wait. Problem is it's trying to connect some of the servers that work and I'm not connected at work, so it's taking a little break from reality. I forgot to establish a connection earlier. That would have saved this time. It will come. Maybe.
There we go. Amazing. All right, so, wow, that's blurry. When you're going to start doing your work for lab six, you're going to be working in pgadmin. Or if you're clever, you're going to go find another tool. I'm just saying, there's many tools to use. Uh, but whatever you use, make sure it's made for Postgres. Now, right now I've got a database called example because that's what I'm going to use. This, this little lightning bolt job right here, that's going to bring up the query tool. And the query tool is where you type in your commands. And this is where I'm going to do my demos. Now, that's a little big. How did I make it bigger? Uh, well, I already had a database called Example. You guys could be using ThinkCube. If you want to create a new database, you click right-click on databases, you type in create, and you give it a name. You pick the database you want to work on, lightning bolt. Or tools, query tool. There's a couple of different spots. So you get to see my awesome shitty typing skills. Oh, come on. All right, so here's what's happening in here. It's going to create a table. It's going to be called test. This is literally what I had on the slide. And I'm also going to create a field called name. I'm going to make it a varchar 50, not null. And I'm going to throw in an active field. Actually, no, I'm not going to put the active field yet. Like this. Now, in this tool, the run button's also, again, a lightning bolt. Congratulations. And I'm going to hit the, the go button. Now, it says the query succeed in 217 milliseconds. And if you're not sure where it is, it's going to be under schemas, tables, well, schema public tables. And here's my test table. And in here, you'll see the two columns that I just created. So I have physically created a container to put stuff in. Now, let's just say I wanted to add, I had a stupid and I forgot to add the active field. I'm going to alter the table test. I'm going to add a column. And actually, I didn't want to call it test. I wanted to call it active. It's a Boolean. It defaults to true. Again, I'm going to hit the Run button. That took 176 milliseconds. And if you want to double check, if it's there, you can hit Refresh. Now you can see it has now appeared in my table structure. Yes? Hey? Yeah. Which is the next thing you guys are going to learn. I'm going to go, let me go grab all this. Now, before I say that, one of the perks of this editor that you won't have with others is the query history. It actually keeps track of all the commands you ran even if you closed the window. Which is really nice. Because I can close my window. At least don't make a liar out of me. And if I bring up the lightning bolt, and it make a liar on me. Oh, you bugger. What? Well, that works on my server, on the, on the other servers. OK, well, don't shut your window until I figure out why it's not saving it. Because if I, if I connect one of my Amazon instances, I still got my queries from like three weeks ago there. So I'm not sure why it's not saving it on my local. That's odd. OK, so I 
So you ask, you know, do I constantly change the code? Here's what happens if you try to issue commands over top of each other. Same commands I had before. I hit run. Relation test already exists. Get used to this error message. A lot of people ask me, what does this mean? And I always answer, can you build this, a house in the same spot twice? You can't unless you knock the house down first. You cannot physically put two things in the same place. It's physically impossible unless you put them in a blender. But realistically, you know, you can't have two desks occupying this exact space. The database is the same way. You create a table, you cannot have the, same, the table exist twice with the same name. That's just what it, how it is. And so if what's going to happen, let's say I, I continue with the examples in this class, I could just keep typing and typing and typing. I hit run, I'll get this error message every time. So there's two ways to handle this. Either you can keep erasing and you can copy paste your commands elsewhere. Or thankfully, recently, Postgres started supporting C style comment blocks. We just got this. We're amazed. Uh, not all database servers support this. Just saying. They don't all support it. Um, what they do support, though, is uh, line level comments, which is double dash. Not slash slash. That's a math operation. Double dash. So I'm going to stick to my comment blocks just like that, because at least that's one you guys know. All right, so I created this table. Now, I'm going to create another table. All right, so far it looks exactly like the other one because I'm not big for variety. However, what I am going to do different this time is I'm going to throw in a foreign key. You know how you guys drag and drop the foreign keys in the editor or some of you are doing it the hard way by creating a manual constraint? I'm going to do it like this. Now, when you create constraints in SQL, there's three ways of doing it. I'm going to show you guys the shorthand version. Why? Because it's the easiest one to remember. There's two other versions, which is a longer version, uh, longer a longer set of commands that you put at the end, and you have more control. So if you use a long version, you have more control on how it behaves. The shorthand accepts whatever the default behavior for the server is. 99% of the time, the default behavior is what you need. Therefore, if you need to get fancy, go look up the syntax. So test ID. It's a big integer. If the other one was a big serial, this one's a big integer. And here's the syntax. Here's the field name. The name of the field is not important. Just saying. It's just that's the naming convention I follow. The data type is important. It has to be the same primitive type as the parent column name, the parent column is. So a big serial is actually a big int on the inside that likes to be flashy with extra features. But it is a big int. The next keyword is references. It's, you're saying this is a foreign key. It's referencing the test table, specifically the ID column in the test table. Now, some people will just go references test. And sometimes you get lucky, and it picks the right foreign key. But you're going on the assumption that the computer is going to do it right. And you guys have been learning programming long enough that you should never assume the computer is going to do what you want it to do. No, it might try to pick the first column of the same data type, depending on the database server. If it's smart, it'll actually look at the metadata of the table and actually see what the primary key is and automatically pick that. Or it'll try to find another field that has the exact same name as itself, because dude, you're called test ID. I like you. Well, I identify with you. In this case, we're telling it how to identify. We're breaking every social, uh, social norm by telling it something how it should identify with itself. So there, now that you'll never forget that ever again after I said that, because it's so wrong. But the references statement tells it, this is a foreign key, 
and you're telling it this is the table and this is the field. And now I'm going to run it and I'm going to hope it actually works. Ran in 170 milliseconds. Now I'm going to expand my view up to the side here a little bit just to show you guys. If I go refresh, now you'll see there's test and now here's test two. And when you look at it, you'll see that it has two constraints. One is the primary key. One is actually the foreign key. And what's cool is if you do it this way, it automatically names the stuff for you. You can actually manually tell it what to call the foreign keys. But this is, it does a good job naming it. And if you look at the columns, there's our three columns happily. I'm going to pull up the properties for this. Properties is a good way to actually see how the table is made. So it shows a bit who owns a table, shows the columns and their data types, shows the constraints. And if I go to SQL, not, not showing that there. Oh, that's not cool. There we go. Here's the, the long form version of the create constraint command right here. So my little references thing can be brought out to that. The other one's a shorthand version of this. You can choose to take this syntax and shove it at the end of any create table command that has a foreign key. As you can see, you get to name it because, you know, if you're that person that likes to name every single one of their Pokemons, this would apply to you. The references is the same, as you can see. It changes how the matching rules are, and it says on update delete or on delete, no action. No, it's saying don't do anything. Give us an error. There's actually rules you can tell it that you know when you delete a row out of this, you can cascade, so it'll kill the parent and the children, and the children's children. It'll wipe out entire family branches. It won't even ask you. It's just gone. And I don't remember what the not valid stands for because I never use it. It's not that important. It really isn't. So that's the long form. I almost never use it unless I have to change one of these two lines right here. So when I delete something or I update something, whether or not it should go down and delete, uh, update the matching children. Now, so far I've shown you guys how to create a table how to alter the table by adding a column. In a few minutes, I'll show you guys how to drop a column. And then I'll do the insert, the update, and the deletes to show you guys how that behaves. But let's say I want to alter my t second table. Test two, add column, active boolean default false. Again, I'm going to run that. Yeah, it's there. Now, let's say I realize I made a mistake and I wasn't supposed to add it to this table. What's really nifty is the drop command for the column is literally that. Alter table, drop column. And again, 98 milliseconds. There's no way on earth you can hit a stop button fast enough to stop it from making from doing that. Don't try to race it. You're going to lose. Um, now, you can also rename columns. You can change the default data types. You can set the defaults. Like I said before, go look it up because every server does it a little differently. How you rename columns, the syntax is not the same on MySQL as it is on Postgres. It's not the same on Microsoft SQL Server. Definitely not the same in Access Oracle. Thus, if you're not sure what you're doing, go look it up. It's like anything else. Yes. It depends who you ask. A lot of people will say, well, well, I like to write my keywords uppercase, my object names lowercase, so I can differentiate. I'm, I'm just too lazy to hold down the shift key. And the code editor I use actually reformats my SQL for me, so it's all nice and pretty. Not this code editor, the one I use for my job. Reformats my SQL statements. But if I were to 
write a proper SQL statement, it would be like alter table test to drop column active. My pinky gets tired. And it, since it makes absolutely no difference, that's fine. Now, it will make a difference if you're working command line. If you're opening up like a, dumb, uh, like a, command, a console level command line, because they won't be color coded. But then the uppercase, lowercase makes a big difference. Right now, things are color coded. Purple's a command. Not purple is not a command. Keywords are purple. Things that aren't keywords aren't purple. And comments apparently are whatever this color is. All right, so. Now, when you look at the column called test, there's three columns, ID, name, and active. Now, as you can see here, I'm inserting the name Bob into the name column and no other pieces of information. I'm going to hit the run button. Magic happened. What kind of magic happened? Obviously, it doesn't even tell you what happened, just it succeeded. Now, there's some database teachers that will tell you this is the worst command on earth. The select star, which is the only select statement you're going to learn today. It is good and bad. It shows you everything in the table. If you have three million rows, it'll throw you every, show you every column for three million rows. It's not always a good thing. So I'm going to hit execute. Now you can see that the ID is automatically filled to one. Why? Because I created it with a big serial. It's auto-incrementing. Active is set to true, because if you recall, I set its default to true. If a column has a default value and it's not listed as part of the insert statement, it looks at what the default value and puts it in. That's why it's a default value. If you were to give it another value that is not if you give it a value that's not the default, it'll accept that instead. Statement here and modify it. Call him Bob2. Hit run. I select everything from test once again. There's Bob and Bob2, and you can see now I've overridden the default value for active. The other thing you'll notice, two fields, two values. And if I try to shove Bob2, I have to watch if it doesn't make a liar out of me, into the, good, it actually did what it was supposed to do. I've had, I've had it prove me wrong more than once from version to version. What I just did is I swapped the fields around. Name is a string. Active is a Boolean. I just tried to shove a Boolean into a string and a string into a Boolean. And it'll tell you, invalid input syntax for type Boolean, Bob2. Did you notice it didn't complain about the name being true? Because it says, dude doesn't know how to use quote marks, whatever. I'll put quote marks around for him. On the other hand, Bob2 definitely does not look like a true or false statement. So, you know, it assumed you're an idiot, and it told you you're an idiot. And it tells you exactly what the problem was. As I said before, it's actually usually pretty good with what its error messages are. It usually tells you pretty accurately what you did wrong. This one's literally telling you, you try to input the string called Bob2 into a Boolean. And then it actually takes the time to actually show you where you did it wrong. It's kind of good that way. Now I'm going to insert some stuff into my table called test2. That's the one with the foreign key. Name. Now, let's see if I did this right. Because everybody needs a Chad. And it worked. Now, some people are going to say, well, there's a foreign key. Why did that work? That's because I allowed it to be null. I didn't say not null. 
I said it had it, it was allowed to be null. So if I go look at the data that's in here, right here, it's, it's set to null. You'll see it shows it in brackets, really thinned out the word null. On the other hand, if I were to take the same command and say, Now, if you look inside a test, you'll notice that ID number one is Bob, it's set to true. ID number two is Bob two, it's set to false. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert so that the foreign key points to two. Chad two is the son of Bob two, because I'm just so good with my names. And I'm going to hit run on this. And it worked. And now if I look at that data that's happening in there, You'll see the foreign key set. Everybody's happy. So Chad 2 belongs to Bob 2. It's not that weird. However, Chad 3 belongs to Bob 3. Now, do I have a Bob 3 in the system already? No. What happens if I try to shove in a Bob 3? Chad 3. Oh, it's saying that the ID number three is not present in the table test. It's telling you, you try to put a value in me that doesn't exist in my parent. So you're trying to tell me that this ID three is my parent, but they don't exist. Imagination parents. Yes? There's no such thing as auto quotes in SQL. Oh, well, you set it to it's, it's trying to coerce the data type. It's not auto quoting. It's coercing. It's forcing it against its will. Okay. It's saying you're going to be a string whether you want it to be or not. And if it really can't do it, then it won't do it. If the value says no hard enough, then it stops. I actually will talk during the assignment. I talk about data type coercing for the second assignment because you should never force a data type. You shouldn't quote numbers if they're going to a numeric field or an integer field. You should always quote your strings. You never quote your booleans. Always quote your dates. Just be explicit. Um, anyways, back to this. If you see this, the foreign constraint rule is, a, is violated, you're violating the rules, odds are it'll tell you what you did wrong, and it's telling you, by the way, the value you tried to shove in the foreign key is invalid. So remember when I got you guys to draw all those foreign keys in your assignment, and I'm getting you to draw foreign keys in the labs? This is literally what you're doing, is you're creating a rule saying you're not allowed to put a value in this child unless it's already in the parent. This is to avoid orphans, because nobody likes orphans. God, I hope there's no orphans in the room. I say that every year, and I always feel bad after I say it. But nobody likes data orphans, because they, the data is meaningless if it doesn't have context. It's like, imagine some guy runs into the room, screams purple, and leaves. He probably says something completely relevant to him, but it means absolutely nothing to us, because we have no context. Referential integrity rules force context. Therefore, when you create proper foreign keys, it forces your data to always have context. Now, it's possible to have null values, which means this data can exist without a parent, and that unto itself is valid. But giving it an invalid value, on the other hand, you're breaking context. Okay, so. We happily did some insert statements, and I'm going to block comment this out. No, that's not right. I'm having a brain fart.
Now you'll notice something in a second that looks really, really bad. Now, as you'll notice, I'm getting this weird highlighting thing happening with my quote marks. In SQL, normally you quote your strings with single quotes. Why? Because it works everywhere. Double quotes don't work in all database servers. So what's happening here is I've got an open quote, I've got a middle quote, and I've got a, you know, another quote that's not paired with anything. You're supposed to escape the quotes. Now, some people, because they're Java people, will do this. Congratulations, that might work. Database people will do this. Don't ask me why, just accept it. That's just the way they do it. But you can do a backslash quote mark to make Java people not upset. And that works. So, if I issue the command as is, and there's already a few people in here that have used databases, so there should be at least one person in here who can answer this question. If I issue the command as is, what's going to happen? Anybody want to try? Okay, go. Yes. It, because I'm not telling it explicitly which one to update, it goes with, I'm going to update all the things. So it becomes Bob's uncle. So I'm going to issue this command. And it doesn't like that because we're not database people. So we're going to try it again. And that worked. Now, sometimes the backslash works and sometimes it doesn't depending on some parameters you've set. Apparently my copy of Postgres is set to not accept backslashes. It's a system level parameter where you can change the whole behavior of the server. Yes. Is there a way to Literally, there is no recovering. There is no undo. Oracle sort of has undo. Um, it is exceptionally complex to set up and is exceptionally unreliable. So you can see everybody's become Bob's uncle. So let's say I wanted to say, well, shoot, that wasn't right. It's not supposed to be Bob's uncle. I can say I want to update row number two. So you see where ID is equal to two? I'm going to change it to not Bob's uncle. I'm going to hit go. And I'm going to look at the data again. Now you can see there's Bob's uncle and not Bob's uncle. Yes. No, I just mean Bob's uncle is a couch potato covered in Cheeto dust because he's not active. He's the neck beard of the family. I shouldn't make fun of that. I spend less time sitting on my couch in the basement playing video games. So, you know, what am I supposed to say? But you know, yeah, the active in this case is not tr not active, not not true. Um, that's how you do an update. And the next one I want to show you guys, actually, let's let's go change that one again because I want to change. Excuse me, I want to make Bob's not Bob's uncle active, so I'm going to change his flag. I'll hit run. Again, it ran in a fraction of a second. You can see now he's active. And how did I do that? Key value pairs that are comma separated. So name is equal to this, active is equal to that, and you separate them using a comma. So you can update every column in a table at once. You don't need to issue five different update commands. You only need to do it once. And then it works. It is what it is. Um, now, the next one I want to talk about is the delete statement. If I issue this command, what happens? It's all gone. So now I'm going to ask you, 
It's just going to go away. Now, this kind of delete is ex extraordinarily inefficient. Because it goes like this. You're deleted. And they go, you sure? Yes, you've been deleted. You're deleted. Are you sure? Yes, you've really been deleted. You know, on and on for every row. Now, if there's like 10 rows, it's still going to happen faster than you can blink because computers are really fast. It'll ask the question, it'll double check, and it'll make it happen. If there's a million rows, no matter how fast it is, it is going to take a little bit of time. If I were to do a truncate, it's gone right away. Unless we have some referential integrity rules. So I'm going to run this delete command. As is. Remember, there's a child involved. Update or delete on table test violates foreign key constraint. ID2 is still referenced in test 2. Oh my, I can't kill the parent, there's a child. So, there's a few couple of, there's a few ways of handling this. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at what's happened in here. Oh, that was dumb of me. Let's try that again. And I'm going to run. Now, you'll notice that both rows are still there, even though only one row broke, told it no. Here's why. And Postgres is smart this way. MySQL is dumb for this. Postgres treats every single command you issue as a complete transaction. In other words, it has to completely succeed, otherwise the entire thing fails. Therefore, if I delete from test, and if any of the rows inside a test says, no, you're not allowed to delete me, I refuse to be deleted, I have a child, think of the child, then it's gonna say, oh, sorry, uh, let's not kill everybody else. It's a nice guy. You know, it's what it is. Now, on the other hand, if you really want to nuke the tables, there's two ways of doing this. First, you kill the kids, then you kill the parents. Right, so if I go delete from test two, oh, there goes Bobby. Chad's parents. And literally, there's nothing left now. As you can see, it happens so fast, you never have time to blink and it's gone. So, you should always remember, if you want to get rid of the kids, then get rid of the parents, you've got to get rid of the kids too, first. It's messy otherwise. Now, I'm going to put some data back in, just show you guys the other way around. Uh, one. Two. Two. I'm going to run this one. I'm going to run that one. Come on. Okay, I'm just adding a lot of data, just to make sure that things are all happy. Now I've got, uh, oh, 17 bobs. Lots of bobs. As you can see, one and two don't exist. Remember I was trying to describe cereals and big cereal students in some labs because they asked, well, why is it this or why is it that? This is like when you go to the registrar's office and you get a little number and saying your number is like 58 and we're serving number three. Once you've been given that 58, nobody else is allowed to have 58 because 58 is you. Unless you give it to someone else, but we're not getting involved in that. Once you've been given the 58, the 58 is you and only you. Just like you have a student number, 040 and five other digits, right? No two people in this room will have the same student number because it's been assigned to you uniquely once. Serials do the same thing. They give out the number once. Once it's been given out, it's done. The only way to reuse the numbers is literally to reset it, which you can do, but normally you don't reset it because then you might start handing out the same number twice. 58, three people come up to the wicket. A fist fight ensues because they all want their, um, their beer money. So now I'm going to add some more children in. So apparently, um, oh yeah, this one's not going to work because 
Bob two never never came to exist. Oh, come on. So Bob two's a philanderer. He's had lots of children. And if you don't believe me, he has lots of kids. So I'm going to add some more Bobs. Bob 4 had a couple of kids. I mean, and go. There we go. He had two kids. He was reasonable. So I'm going to go back over here. I'm just going to look, I look at this again. You can see there's a couple more in here. Now, earlier I said we could also do this. Again, if I try to do a truncate and I haven't nuked the children, you're going to say, dude, you can't truncate. But the message is a little different. It says, can't truncate a table that's referenced in a foreign key. Table test two references test. It's saying, you can't delete anything here because there's children. And I, my answer to that is usually, really, is that. It's called genocide. It will cascade delete everything from that table down. There could be six tables involved in the relationships. They will all be cleaned out. And then when I run it, how many parents did I say I had? 17 bobs, 16 bobs and, uh, you know, a bunch of children. Oops. There's no one no more. Let me, if you didn't catch that, that happened in 141 milliseconds. It actually took longer for the web page to reload than the data to go away. Um, if I come and look, at, look for children, oh, the children are gone. And if I look for the parents, ah, they're gone too. So truncate is cool. Truncate is dangerous. Truncate with cascade is very dangerous. Don't ever do this on a production server unless you know what you're doing. Take it from someone who did it by accident once. It was not a happy day. Uh, yes. It was only seven hours old. <laughs> the good news is that six of the seven hours was that night. There was one hour of data lost. And actually it wasn't such a bad thing because somebody screwed up and did a bunch of big mistakes and we made sure it never looked like it never even happened. That's what was supposed to happen. I just nuked the whole thing. So don't ever do that on a production server. However, if you're trying to test your assignments, it's a great way to test stuff because you're purging the data structure. Now, you've seen selecting, you've seen deleting, you've seen updating. And the last one we've got is drop table. And that one's pretty straightforward, drop table test. Now, don't forget, there's a child table. So if I try to run that, it's going to say, hey, can't delete the, drop this. Because there's children. Now, once again, you could do the lazy way. Well, the smart way. Get rid of the kid's bedroom, then you get rid of the house. Which will work just fine. Or, did you notice in the error message, there's a hint, uh, by the way, you could cascade the drop. So I could drop this table and it'll cascade and take out every other table below it. Even more dangerous than the trunk gate. Because not only will you erase the data, you'll even erase traces of the data even existed. This is not the data you're looking for. So if I drop a table, I drop the table called test two, I hit run, table's gone. I drop the parent table. Nope, test two doesn't exist because I selected it. Parent is gone also. So if you try to drop something that doesn't exist, by the way, it's an important error message. Does not ex if you see something that says does not exist, it probably doesn't exist. The database server is usually pretty sure what's inside of it. So believe the error messages. They're telling you the truth. All right. So literally I went through one of every command I talked about before I pulled up the 
command editor. Um, these are all the commands you need for lab six. Um, these are 90% of the commands you'll need for the insert, update, delete, and or creating tables for your entire database career. Rarely do I need to go past this level of commands for creating tables. My tables are bigger, but it doesn't get any more complicated, just typing more. It's the same syntax. It's just, you know, more of the same. It's not, oh, because I'm going to create this table today, I'm going to use this syntax. I'm going to create that table tomorrow. I'm going to use some totally different way of doing it. That's just stupid. It's the same thing over and over and over again. And how often do I actually do this? Honestly, I think the last time I created table was week five of CST 8215 summer. My databases are established. I almost never create tables anymore. But it's good to know how to do it because, you know, one of these days you'll have to do it. All right. So that having been said, I'm going to go a quick reiterate over everything so it's recorded for people that aren't here, even though most of my group is here today. Um, there's literally nothing due during the break unless you didn't do any of your work so far. Um, assignment one was due. Assignment one drop dead date is during the break. And no, I'm not giving anybody an extra bit of time past that unless we've spoken already. Test one was drop dead date. For those of you that don't mean drop dead, it means you have a pulse of zero, also known as a grade of zero, because it's no, you are not able to submit it now. Um, lab five is due after the break. Therefore, that's that. And after all that is said and done, um, there's nothing to say except, well, I'll see you guys in lab and or after the break, because next week there's no class. Yes. I intend to grab all of these commands and post it, yes. Everything I ran. Me? Yeah, you know. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah, I know. Uh, lecture five. Give me a second to save this. Done. Now I don't need to worry about losing those commands.